In today's video, some 1990s style rumble packed into this modern design as I review a Delta 3D printer from FL Sun. This is the FL Sun S1 3D printer, and it arrives almost entirely in one piece, apart from the door and the brain box. The enclosure is about 50 centimeters across, and I think that I'd also like it about 50 centimeters off the ground. So, given that my presentation stands remain occupied by the Giga, I'll just whip something up for the office. Presumably, once we move out of here, I will design and build the majority of the interior, so this is just good practice. And with Sophie helping, we literally have same day furniture from the concept to the finished product. Anyway, before I flick the power switch, there is a desiccant packet in this built-in filament dryer that needs to breathe. So that goes back in there as shown, and as I go to connect the mains cord, I notice that the machine is also equipped with some sort of a capacitor bank, with enough reserve to power everything down safely in the event of an outage. The initial boot-up sequence takes us through the typical language, Wi-Fi and calibration checklist, followed by a firmware update, which failed until I performed it locally over USB. At any rate, without any further ado, here is some footage of an 8 minute 3D Benchy in the making. Needless to say, this isn't sped up, that's literally how fast the effector is moving. Here's the last few layers of the roof, with the smokestack completing in under 19 seconds. Let's watch. That is silly. In time! 8 minutes flat, which doesn't result in a particularly good rendition, but at these speeds I'm impressed enough by the fact that it finished. Now let's see what the machine is capable of in terms of quality at volume by way of a feature build. And the general takeaway from the makerspace is that two-way bookshelf speakers are a snooze fest. Even something as capable as Dozer could only pride itself on two other makers taking up the project. Subwoofers, on the other hand, my little toy ones in particular, have made their way into a handful of listening spaces often filling in for proper subwoofers. And today I'm feeling nostalgic for the mini hi-fi systems of the late 1990s, early 2000s, so if you're a youngin, this is how mommies and daddies would learn about eviction as the showy enclosures were invariably aligned for output at the not so subtle expense of bandwidth or even its linearity, driving the heavily overrated amplifiers well into clipping. The result was a somewhat finicky delivery, often characterized by a hollow thud, but with a glimmer of that heavy, reverberant bass that seemed to come from everywhere at once. And to capture the essence of this with modern drivers, I designed the Wallop. With a footprint no bigger than a regular sheet of printer paper, it relies on a pair of 5 quarter inch tank band drivers to pressurize the active chamber. The back wave is then routed to a secondary passive stage, ultimately emerging from the back of the enclosure. What this does, in contrast to a single stage bass reflex which under similar circumstances would be very peaky, is that it reconsolidates the acoustic energy from a peak to a band. These are all free decibels, it's just a matter of harnessing them, in this case with resonance, and the result is something that sounds way bigger than intuition suggests it should. That aside, just for a bit of psychoacoustic trickery, I've also hyperextended the lower resonance, not enough to hollow out half the sub bass as with the dorm room blasters of yesteryear, but also enough to render tones as deep as 26 Hz. And to power it, I've gone with the SPA100 plus the plate amplifier from Dayton Audio. That's going to mount back here, once the two halves that make up the body of the enclosure are fused with epoxy along the traditional tone and groove interface. And while I designed the outer shape to complement the cylindrical build volume of the S1, it'll print just the same on any rectangular surface of at least 240 by 300 millimeters. So, once I double and triple verified all the mounting considerations, the printing began at last and stopped just as abruptly with the nozzle scraping the build surface. A quick reset, adding a few tenths of a millimeter to the Z height, and maybe slowing things down a tad until I can get everything dialed in. Right away, the machine isn't winning any trophies for the first layer, and the stringing led me to notice that FL Sun's default PETG profile sets the extruder temperature at 270 degrees, which I promptly dialed back about 30 degrees simultaneously raising the bed temperature to 70. 
The subsequent layers hide the crime, and by the time we get to this 20% gyrate infill, things are looking pretty normal. This continues for another 20 hours, at which point I perform a film and swap to orange. This is also where we get to some of the more challenging geometry with supports holding up the undersides of the cylindrical waveguides. And as you can see here, not only is it curling up along the edge, but the extruder is also beating the living shit out of it on the fast travel moves between features. To the machine's credit, none of this results in shifted layers, as the kinematics employ a closed loop system. Even still, that's another reset, this time with a heavily modified profile and a z-hop of a full millimeter. Once again, the first layer is nothing to write home about, and the following two or three passes cover up the grit. Here's the filament swap to orange, and some tweaks to the slicing profile appear to be the only thing that the machine needed in order to print as it now does. What's more, the built-in camera saves me from having to look just over this monitor. Jokes aside, however, the web interface did prove essential as the touch screen froze on the filament loading animation, forcing me to control everything remotely. Nevertheless, after 70 some odd hours, we have a successful print. All the supports appear to be well formed and they all detach with ease. So, onto the upper half. Once again, here's an ugly first layer, and a really nice rendition of everything that follows. However, this time around, the machine decided to go offline mid-print, forcing me to rely on the touchscreen. And when I got to the point where it freezes on the filament loading animation, I was left with no way to resume. So, that's another failed print. Luckily, the folks over at FLSun took this to heart, sending me a replacement screen kit with instructions to await a firmware update with some corrections based on my feedback. This wouldn't be for weeks, meanwhile I still have the Chilitech X Max 3, so how about some Core XY versus Delta action? Insufficient disk space. This one has to print over USB. And it does, showing off on the first layer, but then quickly becoming humbled by the supports. In fact, another 20 or so hours into the print, it was a ragged mess, so abort. Luckily, at this point, the latest firmware for the S1 had finally been published, so it's right back onto the Delta. And this time, I thought I'd also begin with a 0.3mm first layer, which appears to have made quite a difference. Unfortunately, the print was abnormally interrupted, which doesn't tell me anything other than the fact that I get to try it again. And here we go, looking pretty good on that 0.3mm first layer, here's the change over to orange, and it looks like the screen no longer freezes. 77 hours later, we have the other half of the print. And while it also looks like we have good build plate adhesion, I wish I could say the same from this angle. Nevertheless, it's done. There's even a downloadable time lapse from the webcam. Once again, all the supports release without an ordeal. However, when I attempted a test fit, I noticed that the two halves printed in two different scales. In fact, neither appears to be quite the correct size, with the upper half only a few decimillimeters off target. So, just as a sanity check, I re-sliced the lower half, making absolutely certain that I hadn't accidentally changed the scale value from 100% to anything else, and there goes another reprint. Luckily, I haven't encountered any further issues with the screen freezing, and the print completed in about 80 hours, only to reveal that it too had been scaled down. Not good. At this point, I simply want a locking tongue and groove joint. As it happens though, the failed Chidi Tech print was the correct size, which also means that if I could just get the machine to actually complete the print, we'd be swiftly on our way. Long story short, I did with dense hexagonal supports, which took the better part of an evening to unceremoniously chisel out, leaving scars, abrasions, and other rough spots. Needless to say, the FL Sun handled this part a lot better. And while the two halves are close enough in scale for the tongue and groove to lock, I am not too impatient for the mental comfort of having both halves be printed exactly to scale. So here's a reprint of the upper half on the Chidi Tech, which, just for funsies, decided to undergo some layer separation. Okay, now I'm too impatient. So let's just slap these mostly matching halves together with some JB Weld, and here's Sophie getting the epoxy into the channels. The thing comes together though, can you imagine if this is where I found out that it doesn't? Either way, the following evening the ratchet bars come off, all the insets are fitted with these M4 threaded inserts, and that includes all the ones on the back for the amplifier. The speaker cable is threaded through the little opening, and given that these speakers have no gaskets, some blue tack around the perimeter is an absolute must. The amp is wired in, and even here, some blue tack isn't a bad idea. Certainly better than tracking down air leaks. Luckily, all the threaded inserts still align with the mounting pattern on the amplifier. 
that just leaves the protective shield, which comes together in three parts like so. And once it's on, we are done. This little thing is ready to get rowdy, now I just need some satellite speakers for the mids and the highs. And these Fountech drivers will help me confirm a suspicion that I have about the S1 and its dimensional accuracy. Namely, that it doesn't begin to scale your models down until you exceed a certain diameter along the build volume. So I draw up some pods, 0.62 liters per chamber, which should play down to around 100 Hz. And for these tiny M3 screw holes to align, everything will have to print exactly to scale. So here goes nothing, and just to ensure accuracy, the machine gets all dramatic with the red laser, scanning the first layer for any potential issues. Afterwards, having found none, it continues for another 5 hours, at the end of which we have a perfect fit. What do you know, the machine can print to scale. Here's the other pod, and once again I remain impressed by the clean rendition of all the supports, even the little stick ones that tend to fail on other machines. Anyway, the pods are fitted with some binding posts, the wires are prepped, the drivers are connected, blue tack around the perimeter, that whole thing, and in no time at all everything is ready to go. I'll leave the low pass filter around 200Hz for now until I get some readings, and I guess I'll shove this thing front and center even though that is not where it goes. The DSP is cleared out, and just for starters, I'll get a reading on the pods. About as expected, which also means that I want to apply a high pass filter around 100Hz. The sub is next, and immediately everything above 80Hz is cut. This could be done from the back of the amp, positioning the knob right around here, though I can also just configure the DSP, and while I'm at it, a subsonic filter around 25Hz. The saddle around 33Hz is a little deep with the enclosure sitting on the bench as it does, however, once in place, everything conforms to the prediction quite elegantly. Here's Sophie all set for demo, and just as a palette cleanser, we started off without the subwoofer. The 
specifically makes it sound good in this video. Just how clean everything is coming out. And I know that these things were more than a few minutes of figuring out to get them to stick into the shape of a but holy right, so shit. For the benefit of those on the other side of the screen, how would you describe the experience? Some for specifically. It's more difficult to convey over a set of microphones. It's not overbearing in the, in the, the, you know how when you feel a, a sub sitting in somebody else's room and it's gonna shatter all the windows in the house and you turn it up a little bit too loud, but you can still feel it in your chest. It has this nice, I don't want to call it cold, but it definitely has a precision to it that I wasn't anticipating out of a box like that. Another fun toy for the collection, and despite how this particular print came together, it still sounds quite reminiscent of the mini hi-fi bass monsters of the late 1990s. What's more, with that second acoustic stage, the dominance of the output becomes very consistent whether you listen from the corner, the middle of the room, or even from another room entirely. In fact, have a listen to this. Alright, here are my studio speakers. That's how it's playing, is it? So that's unprintables if you're feeling bored, and while the S1 doesn't seem to print quite that large, it is still an excellent performer within its own usable build diameter, which I would estimate to be somewhere in the vicinity of 290mm. That aside, the latest firmware, a 0.3mm first layer height, and a tall Z-hop setting should mitigate the majority of the issues I've documented throughout this adventure, ultimately allowing for a reliable print experience at speed. What's more, I get the sincere impression that FLSON is trying to do right by the feedback they received from all the testing, which perhaps should have been performed in-house. Nevertheless, the updates reflect improvement, and as I draw this story to a close, the machine has come to perform quite well. Better, in fact, than the Core XY option against the opposite wall. So, rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!